do me a favor, type right now. Yes, it is audible, so you know. Oh. Can you hear me typing? <laughs> and welcome to another episode of 72 Pin Connector. With us today, we have Tom Webster. Howdy, everyone. And Adam Jordan. Hey, what's up? Eh, not too much. How's y'all's weeks going? Not bad, not bad. I'll say pretty goddamn good. For, for reasons that cannot be discussed, but pretty goddamn good. Yes, there is exciting news to come at a later time. Yes, yes. we can't talk about it now. 72 <laughs> Pin Connector is now a Silicon Valley startup. We're writing everything in Haskell. We've hired 70,000 employees, and we have a $20 billion valuation. Actually, Tom, Tom, scratch that. Uh, we're selling. We just got a buyout. Uh, we are done. Ooh. We're going to cut the stream. And let's did, get out did, here. did Facebook buy us? <laughs> um, let's just say that a uh, certain Zuckerberg person, we'll say unnamed, may have just offered us $5. So we're taking it. Done. Done. Absolutely done. done. All right. We're Facebook out. for life. <laughs> so this is the uh, Facebook pin connector. And um, yep. 72 face connector. We connect all of your face. faces 72 ways. What the hell kind of app would that be outside we need of sponsors, a- though? Oh, yeah. We do need Somebody sponsors. Get us some sponsors. Yeah. How about Blue Moon? Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Blue Moon Summer Wheat Ale. The best in weedy, honey, summery ales with moons that are a certain color. Yes. Mm. Th- I will say this has got to be the weakest time for beer. The going really? into spring. I, I don't like the spring rotation. I don't really either. The winter rotation? Oh, my God. Okay. No. So I got... Go this this amazing winter beer and it's so hard to find because it's super local but yeah. they it's a maple cinnamon stout oh my Ooh. god it's amazing Ooh. it's like chocolatey coffee cinnamony maple goodness in a beer like a dark hearty man beer yeah oh it's so goddamn good it's not like a cinnamon molasses thing at the store Ooh. similar yeah, to me, it's, um, especially going into winter, it's uh, either Bell's Winter White or, honestly, Sam's Winter Lager is on fucking point. It is. I don't usually like Sam's, but their winter stuff ain't bad. And the best I'm thing gonna... is, going into winter, you got the fall variety coming in, too. So you got, like, the best two See, possible yeah. seasons. I like the fall stuff. I don't like the winter stuff that much. I don't the pumpkin most beer. I don't I like don't nutmeg pumpkin. stuff. <sighs> You see, I love the nutmeg, which is why I like the pumpkin beers. I mm. like the Christmas spice ales, but I also do love the Oktoberfest. Yeah, yeah. Oktoberfest is good. Uh. Give, me, give me a good old, honestly, I remember um, there was a wing place. It's kind of like a B-dubs. I don't want to say knockoff, but similar to uh-huh. it that offered 120 ounce tubes that you had like a little tap at the bottom of it. I remember going in there in college with two other buddies. We got three of them because, you know, we're in college. So the first two were what you expect, like Bud Light and Coors Light. The final one was Oktoberfest. 120 ounce tube of fucking Sam (laughs) Adams Oktoberfest. That was the hardest thing to drink I've ever drank. It was delicious. Yeah, it must have felt pretty heavy at that point. Yeah, well, it was after eating like a huge burger. Oh, I know what place you're talking about. I'm so sad I, that place isn't there anymore. Yeah, yeah Quaker Steak too. and Lube for uh, all those who are oh in my God. the There are other Midwest. locations, but that one's sold. That sucks. Yeah, there's, there's one in Cincinnati, and I, I swear to God, I am going there very soon. Because the Arizona Ranch is possibly one of the best wings ever. But the best wing ever was their golden garlic. It was mm. oily garlic. It had just the right amount of crisp to it, just the right amount of punch and heat with an yeah. amazing flavor. By far, my favorite wing sauce of all time. You see, we should we should just go there after work one day next week because I'll be in Cincinnati really too. Done. Done. I'll fly. <laughs> I'll fly in. Okay. Do right. it. Do yes. it. I'll fly in because I'm the freak that goes to wing places and gets their burgers. Right. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah. Why? why beat ups. No. Beat ups no. had a really good screaming nacho burger, and Quaker Steak and Loop had the Lou burger that they put their wing sauce on the burger. Yeah, okay, I can't that's knock the Lou Burger. Yeah, the Lou Burger fine. was good. I'll allow it. 
Ah, uh, so so you guys want to talk about some video games? Yeah, I was no. say, let's let's continue <laughs> on with seventy two food connectors. I was gonna say we finally we skipped a few weeks and we got back into the food connectors. So we, we're right. gonna next week we're gonna bring up bolognese sauce uh, and how mm. to make um, a black garlic burger uh, as seen on Bob's Burgers. I actually have the book <laughs> that will tell us how to do it. Nice. So um, anyway. Now the 72 pin or food connector is going to take a break till next week. Brought to you by Bob's <laughs> Burgers. Um, Tom, what have you been up to this week? Well, what I've been up to this week, brought to you by Blue Moon, um, has been some <laughs> light gaming. Um, we're we're going to, if we say company names long enough and often enough, they will have to give us money. I think it's how that works, right? Um, or Something they're just like going to say, hey, or thanks not. for the free ads. I've been trying to get oh. Tim Horton's on Twitter all the time, and it's just damn, working. damn. Okay, well we'll keep trying. Um, <laughs> but in other news, for people who aren't playing us, I have played some games. Uh, I'm going to go through the quick stuff first. Of course, Metroid Fusion, Link to the Past. Those are those are my good bedtime games. Quick, quick question for you: Are you mm-hmm. ever going to beat Metroid? <laughs> I've been going through it very slowly, very sparingly. Mm-hmm. I'm savoring all the flavors of Metroid. You see, I, I just got my space jump so I can explore the area. I've been getting power bomb upgrades that I don't need, but I want them. Um, the, the one thing I love about Metroid Fusion is even though it's Metroid, even though I've been through the game literally over 20 times, it does not baby you. Um, yeah. I got my ass kicked at, at a couple <laughs> bosses, like just flat out kicked. Cause I was like, Oh, I got this. I'm a Metroid expert. I've been doing this forever. No, <laughs> no, you, you got to watch your shit. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll beat it eventually and then go through it again. That's what I do. Um, other than that, hot dogs, horseshoes and hand grenades for the vibe. Uh, uh, of course, some of the just best sandbox VR fun with guns, all of the guns. Um, They've got miniguns now. Oh, I, oh wow. um, I wasn't going to dive into this game, but I found a cool feature, and it takes a shit ton of RAM to pull off, but my mm-hmm. system's beefy enough to do it. You can turn on bullet tracing. So what it does when you fire a bullet, it'll actually trace it out for you to show you the exact trajectory. I didn't realize this. The game has built in realistic projectile gravity. Oh, oh nice. nice. When you fire nice. a like a shot from a sniper, especially like one of the puny pistols, you can actually see it dip. Um, and what's really cool is when it hits, it'll actually realistically ricochet off of whatever you're shooting. They've built in the physics that way. So oh. when using a minigun, I can shoot a bunch of stuff on the ground and look at the, the bullet sprays go up into the air. It's so cool. Nice. So, so uh, goddamn cool. So Dobby wants to know, have you been playing Dark Souls? <laughs> Of course oh, yes. Dark Souls. Why would think? I play something like Dark Souls? <laughs> uh, yes, I have been playing Dark Souls. Dark Souls uh, 2 specifically, because as you might have heard in previous episodes, I did beat the first one. Um, and it, it was not, I did not beat it in a pretty or nice way. It was <laughs> one of the worst fights ever. Um, but I, I can't say I don't like Dark Souls 2, because it's a well-made game. Mm-hmm. I like playing it. It's enjoyable on a Dark Souls level, but it's so it doesn't feel like the first game and I cannot put my finger on why it it just it doesn't have the same graduation of difficulty or the interesting levels or the nice the, the lore is good, but it's definitely not as good as the first game. I feel really disappointed going into Dark Souls 2, and I knew I would. And in, in all of my reading about Dark Souls as a series, 2 is the low point, and there's a reason for that. Right now, I can't articulate it, but it's definitely the low point in the series. Yeah, I've heard that, um, I've heard that the level design is a lot worse. Like, it doesn't flow as well as, as the first one. What, what made Dark Souls... Um, oh, here we go. I've got this now. Uh, what made Dark <laughs> Souls 1 so great and what made it have great level design is because it was a uh, perfect... And uh, various YouTubers have said this before, so uh, this is mm-hmm. not an original thought. Um, right. is, it's the 3D representation of a Metroidvania. They took the Metroidvania level design formula and they built it in 3D but made it actually work. Lots of games have tried this before, including Castlevania itself. Um, mm. But I've never seen level design work quite that way since uh, Metroid Prime on the GameCube back in the day. All the levels are basically big corkscrews. They all feed into each other. There's uh, passages that go to other areas. It's 
a wonderful experience just traversing the world. Dark Souls 2, so far, and I'm, I'm not very far in, but it feels very linear. It feels like, okay, go to this place, hit a bonfire, continue on through, hit a bonfire, continue on through, hit a bonfire. And in Dark Souls 1, halfway through, probably a little bit more than halfway through, uh, you unlock the ability to warp from bonfire to bonfire. Um, oh. In Dark Souls 2, that's unlocked from the very beginning, so they don't feel the need to build these corkscrew, you know, fold back on top of itself levels. Oh, okay, I see. Instead, they straight shot everything, and you can warp back, which really hampers the nice, cohesive world. Yeah. Um, it feels Zero, very gamey. Zero Dawn actually does a good bit of that, like the first one, where the stuff loops around. It gives you the fast travel ability in limitations, mm-hmm. though. You have to build things to do it. But the levels are designed in a way where you go so fucking deep in a location and then all of a sudden whenever you're done you find out like oh shit i'm back where i need to be yeah so it takes you to weird depths in the world that you didn't know was there and you now know you can go and explore but it doesn't leave you there it brings you back parts of the mission tie you back to the main world Mm -hmm. i think that's important um, if, yeah. if, if you get too far into this fast travel stuff, it, it ruins the sense of exploration you get in games like that, which is one of my favorite aspects of games like that is exploring. Yeah, um, I'm and noticing even, that with uh, Zelda and Zero Dawn both. I mm-hmm. think honestly, more in, it, they both do it in different ways. Zero Dawn, you don't fast travel much because you need the resources you find while you're exploring. You need to pick up the medical plants. You need to pick up the things for crafting. When it comes to uh, Zelda, you want to explore. This climbing mechanism they put in it, it just makes you want to not fast travel. It makes you just want to climb up on shit because you can to see what's on the other side. So it's, I really like whenever the fast travel is there, but it's not needed. Yeah, I, I, I don't like it in Dark Souls 2. I, I really wish they would have done the Dark Souls 1 thing where they go, okay, you've, un- you've seen most of the world at this point that you're going to need to go back and forth to various areas, and we don't want this to be a drag. So it was, it was a nice um, a gift to the player where they say, yes, this is Dark Souls. Yes, we aim to hurt you in horrible, scarring ways that will never leave you. <laughs> But we don't want to drag down our gameplay. Uh, we understand yeah. this is a hard game, but it doesn't need to be a slog, right? There's, there's right. nothing about Dark Souls that feels grindy, per se, even though I did plenty of that because I just didn't get good enough. Mm-hmm. Um, but that kind of relates to what we'll be talking about later. Yes. yes. So yes. let's harp on that. <laughs> yeah. Dark, Dark Souls 2, it does, because of linear level design, it actually does... Um, something in i don't want to say a psychological way to the game but it Mm -hmm. the world never feels cohesive it never feels like i'm part of the world it feels like i'm playing a video game which is vastly different than i felt in dark souls 1 it felt like a real landscape to explore dark souls 2 Mm -hmm. just doesn't right now maybe i'm not far enough into the game but what i've seen it doesn't impress me beyond that I have been playing uh, a brand new game because I figured that talking about Dark Souls for an hour and a half probably is getting a little boring for for all of our listeners. But I can go on if you guys want me to. Um, no. Uh, no, no, I'm good on Dark Souls are, are, for a while. Are you sure? I think. Are you sure? I yeah. can I can do more. Okay, <laughs> all right. So uh, I picked on. up abduction, not abduction. Uh-huh. Abduction. 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 What is abduction? Um, It is a game made by Cyan, Mm. uh, which if you don't know Cyan, it's because you hate life. Uh, And it's really because you don't like sloggy, point-and-clicky, adventure game sort of stuff. Um, It's from the creators of Myst. Myst, Riven, that whole line of games. Uh, And it plays almost exactly like those games. I grew up with Myst. I played through the games. I love them. They're great, but they're not exactly action-packed. They're not so, games for yeah. everyone. So for those of you who don't know, Mist is pretty much the prerequisite to The Witness. The Witness drew a lot of its gameplay concepts and puzzling of around the world off of Mist, and they brought it more forward than what Mist was. Mm-hmm. Mist is obtuse. The, the puzzles are... They make sense in its own sort of internal logic way. Uh, the witness is very upfront about its logic and says, okay, here's the language we're trying to present. Here's how you can solve things. Not that it's easy or obvious, um, but 
Mist is a lot of bashing your head against the walls and clicking on random things to see what they do. And the witness is more procedural. I'm going to think about this before I do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, they're very different types of puzzle games. Yeah. Um, I'll go ahead. With, with abduction, um, I'm not very far into it, uh, but so far it does the thing that Mist always did best, better than any other game I've played. And it, it transported you to a totally weird foreign alien world that just made you go what the fuck holy shit this is weird (laughs) yeah um and it got you interested in the story because of the world itself not necessarily because the story was anything interesting but you would get transported to this place and let me let me lay out the the first start of the game so you get like a weird crackly radio voiceover about someone talking about a sparkling light and sure Mm -hmm. enough you see this thing that looks like you know a floating flying ball of sparkler dust or something. It's, it's weird. Um, and you're following it through woods and a campsite, and eventually it sort of lands next to you and a bright flash happens and you're teleported to this weird alien world that looks like it's sort of inhabited by humans, like in a Wild West town kind of way. Hmm. But there aren't people there. There's, there's the towns, there's evidence of life and humanity being there, but there's no people until you meet one person. Um, and it's, hologram, it's that hologram, dude? Yeah, well, he's not a hologram. This is actually a throwback. They did something really weird, and the creators haven't been great, even in Myst 5, it wasn't great, at building three-dimensional character models. Uh, So what they did is, in the earlier Myst games, they would actually record people on green screen, cut them out, and put them into the game as, like, flat plane objects. Um, And it was sort of realistic you could it was an fmv game clearly uh but they went back to that for abduction uh, it adds a really nice bit of retro charm to the game well and the technology is advanced hmm. in a way where it won't feel as awkward it still feels pretty awkward like in in the original mist when you would you know open up a book and that person would talk to you on the page you could totally tell it was janky fmv gaming um, in this, when, when you encounter that door and the guy opens the shutter, it's still janky FMV gaming. You can absolutely <laughs> tell it, but it's, it's not so much that you're like, oh, wow, they had no budget. It, it feels very charming in, in the way that they did it. Um, yeah. it's, it's a little throwback to the older games and the older way of doing things. And I, I kind of appreciate it. You know, it, is it fan service? Oh God. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. There's absolutely no reason to do what they did. Do I appreciate it? Yeah. As a Mist fan, I absolutely do. Um, this is not a game for everyone. Um, literally nothing has happened. Literally nothing. <laughs> um, the, the puzzles are obtuse. They don't make a ton of sense up front. Uh, you're not uh, going to get very far very quickly. But the world is incredible. Um, just in, in the way it makes you think about things and, and wonder mm-hmm. about what is going on. Uh, and they huh. recently added Vive and Oculus Touch support, which is the only Ooh, nice. reason I bought this. Uh, okay. Before it was VR enabled, but you had to have a controller, which ruins the experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but this game is not made for the Vive at all. Yeah, you can tell that there were certain physics things and physics puzzles that required you to, um, uh, you know, like, pull objects or rotate stuff, and it was button presses. So when you use the Vive, it basically says, "Okay." If they click here and they move like this, we're going to have them open the door. But mm-hmm. nothing is actually based in physics, so for a Vive game, it feels very weird. It's kind of jarring. It feels like everything's a static button instead of a physics object, which is not how VR games are supposed to be. They're supposed to right. emulate real life. Right. Um, so yeah, I was looking at this trailer, and this trailer does nothing. I mean, it just nothing. shows random ass shit and shows you nothing. I mean, honestly, if you just had this trailer, <laughs> you wouldn't know it's a puzzle game. You wouldn't know if it was first person. For God's sake, you oh, wouldn't wow. know where the fuck you were. This trailer shows nothing. So how yeah. in the hell? I mean, yes, they show you That's a star. That's not very good marketing. But <clears throat> no, it's what, not. What do they do to set the stage to let you know that this is puzzling? Um, the, do, do, you see, do you see the developer tag there? This game 
is literally not made for you. It's not made for anyone. If you know who Cyan is, if you have bought and went through all of their games, if you followed them to the brink of bankruptcy and then they made Mist 5 and they said, yeah, this is the last game we're ever going to make before we have to get day jobs because we literally cannot support ourselves on this salary. Our families are starving to death. And the Mist community gathered together and everyone bought as many copies of Mist 5 as they could afford back in the day to skyrocket Cyan's finances into the stratosphere, to, to bring this company back from the ash is stronger than ever just because it's got the name cyan on it you know exactly what type of game it's going to be they make hmm. one game they make mist in various forms and that's it if you liked mist this is mm -hmm. a game for you if you didn't like mist stay away that, it's not that, for you yeah. that, that's not really what i'm hinting at though what i'm hinting at is the game itself looked to give no indication of what kind of game it is how did the game present itself how did the game get you to the point where you knew what you were doing? Um, it, it doesn't, uh, but that's that's the missed way. So it, it dumps mm -hmm. you in this world and shit happens and you get teleported. Uh, and then there's stuff you can grab. Like I just I walked up to a mailbox and I pulled it open and look, there's a letter inside, which the the game has a lot of technical issues. Uh, so mm -hmm. the letter text was too small to be read on the. I don't want to call it low resolution, but it is for VR Vive screen. So mm -hmm. to read it, I literally had to hold the note this close to my face, <laughs> like right up against my, my virtual eyeballs and slowly scan the note up oh, to no. read every line individually, like like word by word, because oh. this was so the, the text was just too small. Mm -hmm. Did it fit the art style? Oh, absolutely. But it did not fit the game itself. This is right. it fe very much feels like a game where they built a, a mist style game and then they added on VR afterwards. Uh, it does not feel like a cohesive VR experience with most Vive games. If you wave your hands in front of your, your face, it's got, you know, 90 ish FPS. It's almost indistinguishable from real life. And that's how it's supposed to be because it, it prevents like VR disassociation and a lot of weird stuff you get while playing VR games mm -hmm. with this. The hands are constantly at about 20 to 25 frames per second. So Ooh. you will constantly see them like jerk from here to here in a non fluid motion. It looks like multiple pictures being flashed at you instead of a smooth motion. Mm -hmm. It's kind of off putting until you get to it. There's also some weird. Uh, I do have a stream up. So if you guys wanted to check out our Twitch page, I've got a stream of the game. Um, there's weird uh, graphics calling going on in the sides of your head. So when you turn uh, everything outside of your field of view, your immediate field of view is mm -hmm. is called and blacked out in the graphics engine it does not render it usually that trick relies on taking your field of view and widening it a bit so you never get this area where you're spinning too fast and the graphics engine has to catch up to you that's a terrible thing so i would turn and just out of the side of my eyes i would see stuff clip in to existence from a black plane there's some technical issues here they have to work out and there's a question in chat about the uh, motion sickness when it comes to it. Motion sickness in VR really comes from when you have a choppy head turn and your body doesn't move in the game how you're moving in real life. Mm -hmm. You get this, like Tom's saying, disassociation where I'm here, but I'm not here. I'm not controlling myself. You get that feeling like you're being twirled in a, um, one of those carnival rides that has spin in a circle. But and this isn't just, so much that. The, no, no, the no, no, game, no. I'm, I'm explaining what like happens in oh, the event yes. you have that kind of chop and that mm -hmm. the graphics can't keep up with your motion, what it does to your body. Yeah, Job Simulator everyone, had that issue. Because not everyone's been able to get in VR and don't understand what it means to get sick from playing VR. Yeah, you know how like in, in a game, if you have laggy controls, especially if you've played in these streaming games like on live or even with Steam and home streaming in some extreme cases, when you'll move the camera in a game, it'll take a second for it to register. When your VR system bugs out and frame rates dip like that, it's like you are moving, but your your view stays here, but your whole body's moving. It's really weird. It's hard to explain, but it totally fucks you up. Um, but it's it's odd because the game itself abduction runs pretty well uh, as mm -hmm. far as vr body movement walking ray turning your head the animations are choppy uh it's not really physics based so you don't get the fidelity of interaction you're expecting with right. a vive game yeah um and and some of the animations are 
criminally low frame rate, at least criminally yeah. <laughs> low rendering rate on the screen. Uh-huh. Um, it's it's got some technical issues. I do not regret the purchase. It was a thirty dollar game. Um, uh-huh. From what I'm reading, it's anywhere in the range of five to ten hours to complete it. It's not very long, uh, but it is a full complete Vive game. It's it's probably the first VR game I've bought that's not early access. And they said, yeah, this is done. Um, it can be played non VR, can it? I think so. Maybe because uh, the way you were talking, it almost sounded like I, it wasn't. Really I did not see any ads. VR. It, it looks like it was originally envisioned to be a VR headset with a controller, like the Oculus okay. was originally envisioned, right. because uh, development started, I think it was a Kickstarter in 2013, 2014, if I remember correctly, I'll have to look it up. Um, and Vive stuff and Oculus Touch was built in afterwards, and it feels kind of slapped on right now. They mm-hmm. are fixing it, there are patches coming out, but it's not... Uh, it's not great. I'll have more next week on that. Uh, but for now, I want to hear some of what you're playing, Adam, with, uh, especially with this RE7 stuff. Have you finished yeah. it? Is it done? No, but I'm close. God damn it. I'm definitely <laughs> close. I'm sorry. Um, I got distracted with that Rocket League update. But, you know, I played the same two games the past, like, three weeks, so I don't want to, you know, go too far into this. But um, I got to basically what I'm assuming is the last boss fight or at least the very last segment of the game of resident evil seven got to this big boss area. Um, I don't, the the game definitely changes as you get towards the end. The the beginning of the game is very much Texas chainsaw massacre, survival horror sort of feel to it. And then later on in the game, you get into more, I don't know, Resident Evil 4-ish, more more Aww. action, less horror, but still, it's still got a lot yeah. of horror. So I wouldn't, you- I wouldn't say it's necessarily a bad change, but I, I will say that I kind of like the beginning of the game more. But it's by no means a bad game in any sense. It's Does still it great, like and I, they- still, I still want to finish it, I want to see what happens, that kind of stuff. Does it feel like they tried to unify the worlds of Resident Evil 1 and Resident Evil 4 into this new package? Does it feel like they couldn't leave either behind? I, I really don't know, because I didn't play 1 or 4. <laughs> like I, that, that my my experience tell, with those games are very limited to what I've seen clips of and stuff, you know? Um, so, but it, it's still great. It's still a great game. So you're at this point, I think you know enough of the game to answer this kind of question. So with Mm -hmm. the move, the first person shooter, do you think this game would have been as good in third person fixed camera or over the shoulder? Personally, no. I think a first person survival horror game is much more, uh, I I hate using the word immersive, but it's more immersive. (laughs) Especially in VR. Yeah, absolutely. Especially because VR was such a focus of that game too. Um, the first person absolutely made a lot of the, the tension in the game. If you, you, know, were, you, f- you feel like you're there. If you were told that this was not, this was third person, would you mm-hmm. repurchase the game to play it the first time through? Uh, if it was third person, I probably... I don't know. I mean... I don't know that I would have bought it in the first place if it was a third person game, just because third person horror doesn't immediately interest me that much. But I probably would have given it a chance if the reviews were as good as they were anyway. I mean, yeah, I probably would have played it. Well, what I'm getting at is essentially they made this change and it sounds like this Mm -hmm. change is going to pay dividends for them. Yeah, I think it was definitely a good decision. Because, I mean, you can front load a game to where the first person experience is good, and then let's revert Mm -hmm. to our old tropes and just have you in third person perspective. It's really the best of both worlds because we saw horror games have have very much gone to the trend of what Amnesia started. Uh, First person horror, you cannot fight back, you have to run and hide, which was really effective for a while. But a lot of games have been doing that, and it's nice to get that change of, yes, you can fight back, but do you really want to? Do you have the ammo for this? Uh, these guns are not very effective. You know, it, there's a lot of... There were definitely a couple of times, even late game in Resident Evil, where I would get an enemy encounter, and instead of trying to kill those enemies, I would just run, run past them or try to get around them in some way so I didn't have to use all my ammo, because ammo is very scarce. 
Yeah, there's there's also the the thing that horror games can do, which is one of the most criminally underrated games of all time, Fear, where yeah. they give you these guns in slow mo, and you're a fucking badass, and you're tearing apart like these clone soldiers, and mm-hmm. you're just you know wrecking shit, and you walk to this next room, and this creepy little girl literally explodes people into blood paste around you and she's like <laughs> yeah. yeah what you yeah. think you're something special like it, it brings you to this high peak of i am god and then it just dashes your yeah. hopes and says no you are nothing compared to me it yeah that, is, that was it, cool about fear it was almost like it was almost two games because it was a straight up first person shooter and then it had all of this creepy horror ish story stuff with it too I really, so, really wish but Resident Evil does not feel like that. So okay. Dark definitely Soul <laughs> definitely brought up something I think that's good to call out. Uh, PT was a huge success. I mean, yeah. for just being a demo, I've never heard of a demo getting this kind of hype. Do you yeah. think if PT wouldn't have caught like it did, that Resident Evil 7 would not have showed up how it did? Uh, well, due to timing, I'm sure Resident Evil 7 was already underway. Well, during the time PT came out anyway. I don't know. PT would have been, what, two, three years ago? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure how long ago that was. Because, I mean... I can look it up real quick. But I, I'm just saying that I, I agree with the idea that PT really brought this idea. I shouldn't say idea. It was already there. But, I mean, it really mm-hmm. drove home the psychological puzzle while you're in a horror. Yeah. Where oh, it's absolutely. not just running, it's you have objectives, you have to solve these puzzles, you have to figure out what's going on. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, there's a lot of creepy ass shit that's going to be happening around you. And that's influenced some other games too. There are some games coming out. There's one called Allison Road, and there's one called, uh, oh, what is that one? Like, not visceral. There's another one. Uh, I can't think of the word. There are like two games that are very, very heavily PT influenced, and they look great. They Alice, look so scary. Allison Road, I uh, watched that. I can't remember if mm-hmm. it was a demo or I just watched it, but either way, I think it was a video I watched of someone playing it where you could mm-hmm. tell this is PT. They literally yeah. saw PT and, like, we want to do this. And they did, like, a multi building or multi, like, a apartment kind of thing. And it was really well done. It was really fucking creepy. I would play that. I would really yeah. enjoy that. Yeah, I'm really looking so, forward to that. PT came out August 12th, 2014, uh, in a worldwide demo release on the PlayStation Network. So I think that would be enough time to... I mean, you, you can't completely rebuild a game from the ground up, but you can seriously change around some assets and gameplay ideas within three years to, mm-hmm. to kind of make that stuff happen. Oh, Visage um, is that game I was, I was trying to think of. It looks really good. But yeah, I- uh, and, and just just to you know get our, our check mark for things seventy two pin connector has every week, uh-huh. um, we we can say that you know PT being one of the most influential pieces of uh, in, influential video games ever created in the past five years. Mm-hmm. Um, we can give a big ol' fuck you to Konami. <laughs> oh God, not this again! Burn in no. hell, you pieces of shit. <laughs> I still think this we don't podcast know. is brought to you by Konami. We still don't know <laughs> the entire story to that. That dude is crazy. You don't know what the fuck happened there. Let him <laughs> off the chain. Let the yeah. dogs out. Yeah. So that's your uh, update on that. I think yep. we actually do have some stuff to talk about when it comes to Rocket League, though. Because it's oh, not yeah, the season, the season four update. Yes, it is not status quo. No, no, season four update's great so far. Uh, uh, you know, there's that soft rank reset, so I'm not where I was before. So it's, it's kind of fun to try to climb the ranks again a little bit. Yeah, it's... Um, uh, I'm not even referring to... Oh, I mean, I guess you're not a um, variant guy as much as yeah, I am. Yeah, the drop... No, drop shot is great. Drop shot is really cool. It's probably the coolest alternate game mode they've come out with so far. Really? It's, Definitely. Better than hockey? Better than hockey? Hockey, hockey was, was garbage. Uh, yeah, I don't want to. I, I will hockey. say no. Hockey, hockey was cool for like three days. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't too big I don't on know. the hockey. I just couldn't. I, I hate hoops. Well, I absolutely abhor hoops. I think hoops is inclined for those who are at a higher skill level, and those at a higher skill level don't want to play hoops. What are you hoops. saying? 
What are you saying? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what, what are you true. saying? I don't know. It, it, it involves flying. You have to be able to get up to be able mm-hmm. to do it more effectively. You can chip some in, but I mean, yeah. you mm-hmm. have to know the ball control a little bit on that. I, I like the the crazy mode. What is what is that called? I always Rumble. forget the name. Rumble. 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 I fucking love yeah. Rumble. But drop Rumble shot. Rumble was good. Drop shot. Drop by shot far, is cool. It it messes with your mind. A guy we play with named Kick. He really brought this up, and it was a good point. We've been playing drop shot for about an hour in locals. Then we went to two on two, and it is a mind fuck going from this game where your objective is don't let the ball hit the floor, and then just do nothing but spike it in the floor. And then all of a sudden, you're trying to go back to playing normal. Your brain doesn't want to compute this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah but drop shot, drop shot is cool. Any skill level, it's, it's fun. It's a yes. good time. And there I'm going to have to play this. There are some strategies you'll find out. Like you'll, Once it gets the other side, you're starting to spike the ball. You're intentionally pushing it down. Where on the other mm-hmm. side, you are doing everything in your power. You'll hit it into your own area as long as you don't let it touch before you get control. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it's but, super fun. Yeah. Other than drop shot, uh, all the stuff in the update is cool. The new map is cool. Uh, Manfield Knight. It's just a variant of a map that's already there, but it's really pretty. Free play. Uh, you can, you yeah, can... you can choose which map you want to play free play on now, which is big. That's nice. Um, just little stuff like that. New items are cool. New crates. We've already went over the uh, tier ranking changes, so no need to rehash, yeah. but I appreciate it. The wheels. Look- yeah. Oh, no, I, I didn't like the wheels I like at all. mine. I like the blue. I like the Tron look. They all look so gaudy and obnoxious. I, I saw this thrown, thrown in our, our Discord. So is that the <laughs> weird ass blue Tron wheels I'm seeing over yeah. here? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All and right. the purple, With, purple ones are even more over the top. That's silly. Are they? Jesus. Well, because purple's the hard, hardest. You want it to stand out, man. You want that to be like flashing and pointing <laughs> to it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm a fucking badass, yo. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess this is cool. It looked nice on my DeLorean if I could fucking customize it. Right. Worst DLC I've ever bought. <laughs> no, the DeLorean's good. The DeLorean doesn't need customization because the DeLorean <laughs> is perfect as it is, as the good Lord intended. Exactly. Um, so what is Dark Soul like Invader a says a new crate is kind of lame. Thoughts? Uh, um, I I kind of agree and I kind of don't. So I don't think the none of the wheels, the new wheels, are very cool. I don't think there's actually one of those. Uh, they're purple by default. I think those mm. are going to look sick in painted variants. Yeah. I haven't really checked out much of the painted variants. I don't think the base ones are good, but I think the mm -hmm. painted ones will look fantastic. You get those in black. Oh, yeah. As long as it's not loop or black. Yeah. Um, A couple. There's a couple new black market decals. Oh, one of them looks pretty cool. The other one looked really lame. I was disappointed. Oh, we got Um, someone in chat saying that new black market decal is going for 70 keys. Yeah. 70 dollars. 70 keys. 70 bucks. I love me some Rocket League. Now, I'm not paying yeah. that. Well, that's new too. That'll definitely decline over time. True. It's like all the new items in Dota where they're, yeah. you know, 200 bucks during TI and then directly after they're 20 cents. Yeah. Well, the black markets uh, tend to still keep up in that $10 range at least, though. Uh, like what? The, 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 the cheapest one's like seven bucks. Or seven keys? Seven keys, more or less, yeah. Something like that. Anywhere between seven and like 30, depending on which one. But I like the crate. They, I don't like the high-end stuff. I think the lower-end stuff yeah. is actually yeah, what I really, like. The, I think the decals were more solid this time around. Yes, there's finally a good decal for the Dom. Yeah, and that I just made got me that really one today. Happy. I got that one today, the one with the... Uh, Japanese writing on the side or whatever? Yes. I've been on this crate opening strike, and I was going to end up doing a <laughs> crate giveaway on some of our streams coming up, but this crate may actually invoke some keys. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't give in. <laughs> just, Be stronger than just that. For this crate. I believe fun, in you. But it funds the esports. And speaking of which, the RLCS this season has been really cool. It's been great. Many upsets? I saw Flipside uh, one yeah, there. Yeah, actually. A couple, uh, couple of upsets. Flipside one EU though, if I saw that right, or what? advanced out of EU. Um, I mean, Flipside's in it, and they're going to be in it the whole time, pretty much. 
I was watching something <laughs> where they were just like running. They're it. still early on in the league play. All right. Maybe it was just another but yeah. attorney. But Rocket League is cool. That's Rocket let's, League. Uh, let's move on from that. <laughs> what have you been playing, Eric? So obviously Rocket League, which been there, yes. done that. Um, played a little Stardew, got my sim on. Solid game. Honestly, when it comes out to Switch, I will probably buy it on Switch. So I'm trying not to yeah. advance too far. Um, and Zelda. I have um, done a little bit in Zelda I think it's worth talking about. This yeah. concept of you can go to Ganon really early and try to fight him. Mm. It's true. See those mountains? It, you can go there. <laughs> it is 100% true. You can get in there. Yeah. I snuck into Ganon early. Um, there's temples in here that give you special things you're supposed to beat. I did two of them, and then I went. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really, really fucking cool what these temples end up doing. I'm not going to go into details, but it's incredibly mm -hmm. unique how these temples interact with the final boss fight. So mm -hmm. these optional temples will do something, and it's really fucking cool. Nice. So you can go in there and just beast mode it right away if you want. Highly unlikely right. you're going to pull it off, but I think the speed, uh -huh. the best speed run right now is 55 minutes. Nice. Got it down okay. for 57. Dem strats. Yeah, 57 is um pretty insane. But yeah, um it's really cool. Open. You can do that if you want. Uh, that said, dungeons. I've gotten deeper in them. They're fantastic. And god damn it, this world. It is so fun to explore. <laughs> Um, this and Zero Dawn coming back to back is incredible because they do two yeah. totally different things. Where Zero yeah, Dawn... Yeah, your open world fix for real then. <laughs> yeah, Zero Dawn's climbing is the Skyrim jump on shit, feel like you're breaking it means. Where yeah. Zelda, <laughs> I think we're going to look at open world games before and after it. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's oh, yeah. going to have this, the... GTA, this is a paradigm shift. It's going to have the GTA 3 effect. Where up until yeah. GTA 3, there wasn't really much. After GTA 3, it's like, this is what an open world game is. And everyone mm -hmm. and their brother was making games like that. Yeah, I, I, I like to see, and I, I hate this term because it's very pretentious and game devish, but I, I think we're going to see from Breath of the Wild creating these nice, relatively simple to understand systems that interact nicely with each other. We're mm -hmm. going to see more emergent gameplay come out of it, which is a term of these systems interacting to bring forms uh, to bring forth uh, new gameplay ideas like, mm -hmm. you know, using lightning uh, and metallic objects to chain lightning into enemies and stuff like that. I'm, I, I completely agree with you. I think we're going to see some cool stuff come out of this. And I don't even and, necessarily and some think, bad stuff. I'm not sure it's going to be the physics even in the way that stuff interacts because I mean, Just Cause has been doing that kind of, Just Cause, um, uh, damn it, Ubisoft's open world game. For fuck's sake, why did just... Uh, Far Cry? Far Cry, yes. Far Cry's been doing that kind of stuff too with interactive systems. I think the climbing elements, this is the first true climb what you fucking want system yeah and it has opened up the realm of possibility to open world games to a place it's never been you see it you More go fucking vertical. get it <laughs> like you can do whatever the fuck you want and also the yeah. systems are fantastic you can go yeah, stone absolutely. surfing you can go uh sailing on a log you can sled down a shield <laughs> So with with Zelda, have you gotten to the edge of Hyrule? Have you gotten to the edge of the world? I actually have a picture I'm going to uh, be tweeting out after the podcast, a screenshot I took. I most most of the game is boundaried in a way that you can't get to it. There's like this big canyon or something like that. Mm. I reached a spot where it's just like, hey, you can't go any further. There's actually a bar that comes <laughs> up and says, you cannot go any further. Yo, yo, turn around. <laughs> wow. I didn't think they'd do that, but Yeah, that's wow. surprising. Yeah, I thought huh. it was kind of lame the way they did that. As well as everything else is. I was like, oh, yeah. come on. That's a letdown. They could have done something a little more natural. Make a mountain that is so high that if you have five stamina circles, you can't reach the top. Uh, they were probably worried about people trying to climb that thing for like 100 hours. They were probably worried oh, about you, someone you know figuring out how to climb that thing. Yeah. And then finding out yeah. there's nothing. <laughs> I don't know, but but you know, speedrunners break games like that all the time, and it ends up being mm. good fun. There's there's an entire YouTube series about breaking boundaries and getting yeah, past invisible walls. Yeah, that's a great walls. series. Boundary break. Check that out on YouTube if you like anything about game design or or breaking games. Uh, really interesting, cool stuff. Mm. 
Uh, the the Dark Souls episode in particular is excellent, so check that out. Yeah, yep. and uh, Dark Soul pointed out uh, Zero Dawn had its flaw when it came to the edge of the world too. It had mm, um, do it? hard boundaries, like w- invisible walls. Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, you, uh, yeah. It you got hate rough. to see it. <laughs> it, it sucks because it was hard to get up to the point and you get to the spot like oh yeah i'm getting ready to get over this mountain be able to see what's there and then all of a sudden it's like oh fuck yeah <laughs> for such a beautiful game once again in this day and age there's better ways to institute boundaries make it something mm-hmm. that is impassable and then put up an invisible wall on that that way if someone tries to break it you have the middle finger up to him fuck you you're not getting out <laughs> or or you could do the thing where you know like with runescape right everything outside of these boundaries there's something that will just wreck your shit almost instantaneously you go outside these boundaries you will get eaten by dogs and you can try to get as far as you can but you'll probably get eaten by dogs it's just it's not a matter of if you'll survive it's a matter of how long you'll survive actually mm-hmm. halo 3 did really good at that a level called snowbound uh, there was turret sentry set up, and once you left the boundary, they started shooting you. Oh, nice. Wow. Nice. Um, but that's enough with the gameplay. Um, anymore, we're just going to be rehashing. So mm-hmm. we do have some news, and uh, let's start with some fun Switch news. So after radio silence about the desync issues with the controllers, they um, actually announced that there's a fix without ever acknowledging there was an issue. So um, <laughs> they um, have came out and said that it was a uh, manufacturing variance, which is interesting. Yeah, so this, this happens with virtually every type of manufacturing, just, just small, little manufacturing. I wouldn't call them defects, but there are tolerances that you know stuff will get forgotten or cut a little too thin or cut a little you know, at too harsh of an angle. Um, Nintendo's done something odd where, uh, and you see this in several other products, but not necessarily in game systems, as we were talking in the pre-show role, um, where they're using various manufacturers to build their Switch controllers. Uh, Apparently one of these did not include a little piece of uh, insulating foam, which absolutely causes some issues <laughs> so it was really funny uh cnet give them all the credit in the world since cbs bought them they actually work really close to their gaming department which is weird but um mm-hmm. cnet tore apart the controller took pictures of it and then sent it in for repair got it back tore it apart took more pictures all nintendo did was add insulating foam to prevent frequency interference that's all the fix <laughs> the was. The simplest shit. The simplest shit. You it's, could do this at home, most likely. Yeah, it's sad to see so, so many issues being caused from something so small and stupid. So the one oh, but thing... But that's, that's totally what happens. The one yeah. Apple had that <laughs> yeah. issue with one of the iPhones. Yeah. I want to call this out because I think this is shitty. It's good that they're fixing it, but mm-hmm. their repair policy is you contact us, you explain the situation, we'll say yes or no, we'll fix it. If mm-hmm. we fix it, you ship it for free, but you're going to be seven days without that left Joy-Con. So you have seven yeah. days, potentially, you may not be able to play your console that you just got two weeks ago. I think a lot of people are just going to be taking it apart themselves and putting some insulating foam in. Well, so yeah, that's what I'm going to do. You have, you have to think, that's us. Yeah. Consoles are often bought by moms and dads and given to seven-year-olds. True. If you let a seven-year-old know. take apart seven. Of- Okay, You're also going to have a lot of brother, older brothers and cousins that are charging 10, 15 bucks to fix people's controllers for them. Yeah, that's true. Like, like all the Red Ring of Death uh, repairers. <laughs> yeah, and I've also seen how those go. Send it into yeah. Nintendo. Don't let someone else do it. But I just think... Just wrap, it, the control, <laughs> wrap the controller in a towel for a while and let it run overnight. I just think though it's <laughs> shitty that they're doing this thing of you send us yours, we'll fix it and send it back rather than mm-hmm. we already have a refurbished one that we are signing off on. We're going to give you yeah. it. You send yeah. us in yours in the package that we sent you. So you have zero right. time without. Yeah, it, it, would be, it would be nice for them to do that. On the other hand, from the business perspective, if this is... Point zero zero one percent of the sold left Joy Cons that have this issue. It doesn't make any sense for them to just change any processes for you know the 
the hundreds that are out there. No, 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 right? no. You're mm-hmm. talking not that low. You're talking a quarter to a third of population. Okay. Uh, do do we have because Nintendo's been silent on this? Do we have actual numbers from Nintendo of how many of these are impacted? We don't have actual numbers, and they'll never release those numbers. That won't go to stockholders. That won't go to anyone. Right. That is internal only. But I know that all the different sites, like IGN, I think it was like uh, half of them had the issue. Bombcast only a quarter did. But I mean, it's prevalent. Um, mm-hmm. I know one other or two other people that have it, and both of them are having this issue. Okay. Oh, wow. So this is not a small scale thing. This is more widespread than Red Ring of Deaths. Maybe hmm. it's a it's a good thing that I haven't gotten a switch yet. Which, uh, by the way, I have a little bit of switch news. Um, I've seen some of the bigger gaming sites talk about it in the past couple hours, but rumor has it that on the twenty fifth, Toys R Us stores will be getting a truckload of switches. Uh, nice. Maybe not like a truckload each, but they will have some of them in stock depending on store and availability. So if you don't have a Switch and you want one, go check Toys R Us tomorrow. They may or may not have one. I know I'm going to. Uh, nice. So we do have some other little quick news. Um, Battle.net is no more. It's been updated hmm. and it's gone. So for all you um, who are still on there, you're like, what the fuck are you talking about? The newest update is supposedly just remove the name. The service is up. It's just called, um, I don't have in front of me, Blizzard something or other. But it's a non-confrontational name, and it's designed to sound more like a general service for games rather than what initially started up as, which is Warcraft and Starcraft and Diablo Mm -hmm. 1 matchmaking. Yeah. Um, I I get it. It does hurt me a a little bit because... (laughs) Battle.net is so classic. You it, feel like it, a part of the Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a staple of the industry. Battle.net has always been there. It's it's like when uh, when Valve, well, they didn't close it, but they stopped using WAN, the World Opponent Network, for their their Counter Strike matchmaking and not matchmaking, but server browsing. And then they mm-hmm. went to Steam, which everyone, if you didn't grow up back in the days of PC gaming when Steam was first being introduced, it was actually one of the most hated pieces of software ever released. A lot everyone of people refer to it despised. as malware. Yeah, everyone despised Steam. And, and to be real, Steam was a piece of shit back in the day. It would do anything from delete your saves to mark your games as invalid to not let you connect to, to servers. Like, it was... It's come a long way. Uh, but, yeah, Battle.net. <laughs> rest in peace. I will always remember you. <laughs> and then we have a tidbit of Rocket League news. Uh, with its recent popularity, there has been a sports betting site in Australia opening up betting on major Rocket League tournaments for the pro scene. Psionics did not like this. They're trying to get out in front of it and make sure everyone knows we are not a part of this. Yeah. They want their name cleared. <laughs> That's just PR. Yeah. Oh, and they really don't want to get messed up in that because being yeah. they're a United oh, yeah. States company, right? Yes. Yeah. You getting messed up with that, you get some serious, <laughs> serious issues. Oh, yeah. Um, Switch, fastest selling Nintendo system. It's really misleading, but yes, it is. <laughs> um, it had the least amount of inventory issues in recent years. Mm. It releases. Mm-hmm. I, I think the, the mere fact that it sold faster than the Wii, uh, and, and the Wii was plagued, absolutely plagued by stock issues, but the fact that it sold you know, faster than the Wii is huge. Um, you know, we're, we're all looking at the Switch as Nintendo's swan song of if this thing fails, Nintendo could be in serious financial trouble as a company. Mm-hmm. Uh, and right now, it looks like they hit a home run. And... and Frankly, it's because they put out one really good game. There is literally yeah. no other reason yeah. to buy a Switch. <laughs> Snipper Clips is not selling this system. Alternative right. facts. Um, there are theories out there that people are assuming the attachment rate of Zelda to Switch is nearly one-to-one. Yeah. I wouldn't doubt that. Right. I'm just going to buy a Switch and one to Switch and nothing else. And <laughs> then we will ban you from ever talking again in any 72 median. So, uh, Dark Soul Invader, we're actually looking for a new person for 72-pin connector. If you would like to join the crew, uh, we do have an opening <laughs> immediately. Ah, but... I hope you know how to edit audio. Yes. Please, <laughs> for the love of God. Um, 
There is a tournament going on right now. It's a uh, Halo 5 World Championships. It is a $1 million prize pool. It has a following, not nice. that big, but... $1 e million, bucks, so that's, that's not something to glance over. It's not nothing. That's a nice chunk of change. Um, they, uh, they had casters. Nice the production wad. value looked, looked really good. Um, I, I watched a little bit of it on Twitch. I, mm-hmm. I, I am not a Halo super fan by any means, but uh, it looks good. Yeah, it's, it looks okay. Um, Splatoon 2 test fire is on it's going and i've missed it part of it Mm. they're doing one hour intervals that's it like there's two hours today you can play next hour starts in four minutes um there's three different hours tomorrow and then there's two Mm. hours on sunday i don't get it that's odd yeah why not just do like a free day like all saturday or something uh tom and i were talking about this uh, we don't know if they're trying to do different configurations for each hour, but mm-hmm. it just feels weird. Huh. So wait a minute, hold on. Nintendo doing something online that doesn't follow what everyone else would normally do and doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Huh. Hmm. Huh. I am surprised. Weird. <laughs> In other news, uh, Telltale's The Walking Dead Season 3 now has a release date uh, and a new trailer, so go check that out. Uh, it will be due out in four days. March 28th is the current release date for Season 3. Uh, I haven't yet finished Season 2, so I probably won't be picking this up. And but there's if you're a fan, go grab it. One more mm-hmm. release date before we get to other fun. It has been leaked via a poster. Destiny 2 is supposedly coming out in August. Hmm. This was leaked from a picture that was supposedly taken of a poster at a GameStop affiliate in France. Weird. But Destiny 2 coming up, I will probably get in on that. I was (laughs) around too late on the first Destiny, and I didn't want to get in on an MMO that late in the game. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, I know the feeling. Also rumored, potentially coming to PC. That'll be interesting. Nice. That'll be really interesting. I might play that. I figured that would fancy Tom. I I might play that. So So. we do have a topic. We do have a group topic. Um, We want to talk about uh, difficulty in games. Uh, And this can range from anything from, you know, personal preferences, trends over time, uh, what makes a game difficult, how can you make a game difficult, what does it well, what does it poorly, how do you overcome it, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick it off to Eric for a more formal introduction to the topic. So the big thing we really want to discuss is not necessarily like, hey, games are easy. Games are hard. <laughs> we want to kind of get into more. Uh, game is hard. Yeah, games game are real hard. hard. We really want to try to get more into like the trends of what's kind of been happening over time. Why game difficulties have seemed to have changed. Mm-hmm. And really the reasons before it. Like one of the big things I know we wanted to discuss was there is this big concept of old games are hard. Yeah. And you hear it all time and time again. That retro games back in the 90s, 80s, late 80s, early 90s were just incredibly difficult. Oh, yeah. And a lot of that is not necessarily that the game itself was intrinsic, it was difficult as much as it was a design. These games yeah. back in that time were not made to be ran in three hours. I'm going to drop some knowledge on you. Yeah, go for it. So I'm for Tom's 72-pin connector. I'm sorry, 72 history connector right here (laughs) on the 72-pin connector podcast. Back in the day, games were built to make money. Kind of like today. Uh, But they made money in different ways. Back in the day, games were only microtransactions. That's kind of a nightmarish statement when you think about it today. uh, But it was all arcade games. It was the new hotness. It was uh, the best thing ever. When you wanted to play Pac-Man, you threw in a quarter. When you ran out of lives, you threw in another quarter. They were designed to be quarter munchers. So if a game was too easy, it didn't make enough money. Mm -hmm. Um, Arcade owners have to buy these machines, which are, you know, anywhere from five to $10,000. I mean, they're not cheap machines. Even if you buy arcade machines today, they're, you know, thousands of dollars a piece. Um, So to recoup that investment, you have to make a lot of quarters. Uh, so if the difficulty of the game was too easy, it became a bad investment and you wouldn't sell any cabinets. There was also uh, if a game. 
Mm -hmm. As I said, there was also one other thing they did outside of difficulty. The revelation of high scores. Yes. Yeah. The high scores to draw people to also try to beat their buddies. Drop quarters. Yeah. Um, so the games were originally designed to kill you often, quickly, but not unfairly. The games that were too hard, the games that were munching too many quarters, consumers quickly caught on. They're like, wow, this game sucks. It's not fun. I don't want to play it anymore. And it just it didn't become a good investment. Stuff mm -hmm. with a really nice middle-of-the-road difficulty. Space Invaders, Pac-Man, Galaga. The, the classics that we know and love today had this perfect middle-of-the-road difficulty where it killed you enough to be profitable, but didn't kill you so much that it became unfun. Mm -hmm. um, then we get into the early consoles uh, life cycles, like uh, you know Atari games, or I want to focus on NES games in particular, where those design decisions from the arcade days carried over into console gaming, where they had life systems, they had continues, um, they really carried over a lot of the trips from the arcade era, because that's kind of the game design bread and butter back in the day. It was just the way games had always been made, so why change it? Um, but there was also a secondary effect to that. The cartridges themselves couldn't contain 60 hours of content, you know, max they could contain, even in a slow game. 10 hours of content for something like Final Fantasy, probably less. Um, so the games had to be difficult to sort of artificially lengthen the time you would play the game. Mm -hmm. This is back in the heyday of, uh, you know, mom and pop video rental stores where you could walk in and pay a couple bucks and get an NES game for a weekend. If you could beat it in that weekend, you didn't have to buy the game, which doesn't do the game company any favors. So mm -hmm. if you could play Castlevania 2 and get your shit wrecked over and over and over again, eventually you'll buy the game to try to beat it. And because it's difficult, it would take a long time. So that's kind of where the whole retro is hard came from. It was less that games were designed to be harder, as it was kind of just a product of the times and the game design decisions around that era. And the games weren't able to be massive. So by making them difficult, they would be able to keep the game that would actually only be a three-hour game and be able to fit it on the cart, but making it more time and time again because you would die. So it does expand the time because it and allows it to keep the cartridge size small because they were already trying to work magic to fit these games on these carts. So making yes. what little was there be forced to play over and over again did them a ton of favors if you look at just the the way nes graphics are designed and in the everything from uh pixel art to uh palette swaps for varying enemy types it's they did fucking magic computer science magic to get as much data into those things as they possibly could something like mario 3 is a master's class in compression technology and then as you leave that generation of consoles is when it starts to seem the difficulty ramp changed. Carts By a wide margin. The SNES yeah. still had some, but then disc-based games are where things started to change. That's the kicker. They I, were think able games, to I think games started to shift more... Um, I don't want to say necessarily story driven because they were always story driven games even early on, but you definitely saw more more story content, more um less less like level 1, level 2, level 3 and more these overarching, you know, environments and stories. Well, and I think that that when when your your game's focus is less on keeping you in an arcade and making money they focus on the, the story the gameplay um they, they can be more lenient with difficulty yes one thing that game companies um you know figured out during this time is hey if we make a bunch of content but make our game too fucking hard and people don't actually get to it, we have literally burned developers' time for nothing. Yeah. So we need to make sure that we create the content that people see and not a bit more and not a bit less. So you would get games, you know, whereas um, in earlier games you could die halfway through and never see the later levels, um, you would get games with easier difficulty, you know. 
the save states, for instance, continues, mm-hmm. passwords, being able to pick up where you left off and, and sort of, you know, take you through this this trail of, of game content and whatever you're playing to show you every single set piece, weapon, enemy, uh, everything you could get your hands on, because if they didn't, it was wasting money. I think you hit on the very first thing that made games stop being difficult, and it was the ability to save. Being able to save allowed you to not have to run a perfect run. It allowed you to be able to die and go back to where you were. Mm -hmm. And that was huge. Because if you're on World 8 of Mario and you die, son, you're going back. You better have that all those green mushrooms or you're going back to (laughs) 1-1. But in something like Final Fantasy, you run into Omega Red Mm -hmm. or Ruby, whatever the hell the fucking, I can't remember the weapon's name anymore, but he destroys Mm -hmm. you. Oh, okay. I'll just reload in less time. Yeah. And even in, in, in as games have gone on, it saves so much. You never have to worry about that. And Not only can you save at any point from the pause menu, most games just auto save at random intervals anyway at certain points in the story. Especially nowadays, that happens a ton. Yeah, and, and this is mostly mainstream games, not necessarily like, you know, the more niche styles and stuff like that. And I think... Yeah, and this this is getting... It, that's kind of a big thing in consoles, but even if you go back to the original Doom, where you could save anywhere, anytime, you could bind quick save to a key, you know, save scumming in PC games has basically always been a thing. And I think that's why the the difficulty, if you go back to your classic multiplayer games like StarCraft or Quake, um, the difficulty didn't come from the single-player experience. It came from multiplayer. And that's kind of where PC focused, is on these uh, big multiplayer set pieces. And you can even see that influence today. Well, and it's that save state was possible on computers because computers had hard drives. For those who don't know, for cartridge-based games, you had two save options. And really, in early gens, there was only one. You had to have a small watch battery style battery in the carts to be able to hold a charge so this register would keep your exact information of progress. If that battery dies, you lose everything. More importantly, this made your cartridge more expensive to produce. So back in the day, when you would stamp down a cartridge on, on a printed circuit board and you'd say, okay, this is my game, they say, okay, it'll cost x to produce that means that your game has to be priced this much to make up this much of your profit and offset the cost of printing the cartridges Uh, digital has made everything so much easier because you can just push the bits out to everyone who wants it Uh, adding that battery adding the save feature was actually a pretty pricey cartridge add-on back in the day the technology was fairly miniaturized it was fairly specialized and not every game used it so it was kind of a luxury item if your game was able to save Uh, Kirby's Adventure on the NES was actually a pretty expensive cartridge to produce. And that's also a big reason you have a lot of the original Pokemon games right now. Uh, People are buying them up and they're finding that, hey, I can't play this anymore because the (laughs) batteries are dead and you have to replace them. But that's a little bit of a tangent. Um, I do feel that um, the save states are what actually kept certain games actually difficult, though. Um, I look back to like the original Xbox Ninja Gaiden. That game was bad or uh, bad. I mean, brutal. It was hard. (laughs) It was a good game. It It wasn't, it wasn't a bad game. (laughs) And what made it worse is it's safe states are very much how dark Souls safe states are for those who haven't played Gaiden, where you have a large stretch that you're going to have to go and you're going to kill everyone between it. And you see that you see that safe space, you know, it's there. And then here Mm -hmm. comes that guy you didn't know was there. Boom, you're dead. You have to go back and replay that stretch again. It was not a surprise if you had to do the same stretch for over an hour to get to the next safe spot. A lot of the difficulty in something like Dark Souls or Ninja Gaiden comes from the lead up to a boss. The boss itself might be difficult, but if you fuck up that initial run to the boss room... If you use, you know, all of your healing items, just getting to the goddamn door and you walk in, you're already fucked. Mm -hmm. So it becomes sort of this balance between 
memorization, playing it safe, and in some cases, getting naked and just fucking running. Yeah. Uh, which I did far too much in Dark Souls to be proud of. Naked uh, runs were, were a favorite of mine. I like that it adds that sense of forward thinking. Yeah. Like, as much as I hate playing through the same part a bunch unnecessarily, it, it definitely adds more depth to certain parts of the gameplay. Well, and it adds a dynamic of, okay, I didn't do that good right there, but here's the save spot. Do I want to doom myself going forward and save? Or do I say, fuck it, let's see how far I get, and if I can get to the next one, then I will. Because mm-hmm. I've been in a situation where I've, in a game with uh, set save states, where I hit a spot, I saved, and I was in a bad mm-hmm. location. I had no health, and then bam, here's yeah. a boss. I had no clue. Yeah. Yeah, yep. I actually, in the original Half-Life, which it was pretty good about this, but it occasionally fucked you, uh, it would autosave in certain points, and I actually, it autosaved me at one health right before I got shot. So that save was just a permanent instant load death. Always. No matter what. <laughs> it, it totally fucked me over. Uh, luckily, it was a PC game, so I could just go back to a previous save, and, and that yeah. was fine, but I had to replay that area all over again. But and um, I liked when games do that, but I also really, really liked what something like Resident Evil did, where, oh yeah, this is where you save. You can't save, though, because you don't have the resource you need. Mm. Where you had to have those ribbons. Yeah. You had to yeah. have items to save, or like uh, Final Fantasy, you needed, the old Final Fantasy, you needed a tent to save in the wild. Mm. If you didn't go to an inn. Yeah, definitely. And a, a lot of this changed in... Um, you know, kind of the, the re-releases of game for gamers were playing more on the go. So in the Final Fantasy 1 remakes on the Game Boy Advance, you can save anywhere at any time because that's just what people expect from a mobile game. Um, in If you compare something like Super Metroid to Metroid Fusion, Metroid Fusion has a metric fuckton of save rooms everywhere because it was built for the Game Boy Advance. Super Metroid is a sit-down and... It might be 30 minutes to an hour before you hit the next save room. In Metroid Fusion, it's like, oh, you need a save? Yeah, go back this way like 10 seconds. You passed like eight of them. <laughs> well, like what was put up in chat, um, I think the save state positioning and capabilities also has a lot to do with your casual or your um, target audience. If you're going mm-hmm. after mm-hmm. casual gamers, you don't want them to be locked into an hour and a half run to the next save state. You might lose right. them. They want to be able to save quick. They want to be able to save at intervals. They want to be able to get in and out for a half hour session and done. Mm -hmm. It's the difference between difficult and punishing, right? Dark Souls is a difficult game, but it's not a punishing game. It never feels unfair when you you get fucked over and when a, a run to a bonfire is a little bit longer there's one section of the first game i was going through and i was trying to do this crazy long run absolutely perfectly because i just fucking missed the bonfire i ran past it every single goddamn time if i were just to stop and look around for a goddamn minute it was right there so it actually, in some cases, the difficulty can force you to play smarter. One of the ways you can overcome difficulty is by slowing the fuck down and getting good. And yeah. games that do that, I think, often feel the most rewarding, where there's typically Absolutely. there's multiple ways to over that games have you overcome difficulty. There's the you get loot, there's the you get skills, and then there's just the fuck it, strap up, get better. Yeah. Where you will get some loot, you will get some items that help, but you yourself have to progress as a player. Mm-hmm. I think those are the best for sure. It's it's the most it's, it's the most satisfying because you know you you beat this part not because you got this special item, not because you leveled up your certain skill enough, but because you actually got better at playing the game, the mechanics of the game, the strategy of the game, the decision making of the game. And I actually didn't believe that Dark Souls did this. I was thinking, oh, well, you know, once you go through the game, you get all your armor and weapons. It's kind of a cakewalk, so nothing, nothing matters. And then I saw, like, a standard new game run where you're naked with a club and people yeah. s- refuse to level up and they go through the whole fucking game with a yeah. naked run club because mm-hmm. they got good. Yeah. <laughs> I do think there is value, though, to the other end, the number growing systems. Like, I played a lot of, back in the PS2 era, a lot of D&D style games like Dark Alliance, Boulder's Gate Dark Alliance and Champs of Norath, where mm-hmm. you get a lot of gear. 
and your numbers yeah. grow huge. And by the end of your playthrough, it's like, oh, well, fuck, final boss, boom, you're dead. But those mm-hmm. games had another difficulty functionality that was beautiful. They had the new game plus features where once you beat those that game, you say, okay, show me what you really got. And they put you into a new game, you keep your stats, and you start over. Where things just utterly beat the fuck out of you when you start. Yeah. Um, th- I have mixed feelings on this. Because I would like for... Well, not necessarily New Game Plus, but... I like games that have that extra hard mode that's optional. Because you can appeal to more casual players... And you can appeal to people who like a really difficult experience, but it's the same game. Both types of people can enjoy this. Yeah. Both types of people can enjoy this game. And I'd like to see more of that. Uh, What game was it? There was uh, Mass Effect. Mass Effect. uh, The later games, at the very least. Um, Their difficulty selection at the very start of the game, which you, if I remember correctly, you could change later on, so you weren't locked into it, which is great. I hate being locked into a difficulty level because. Mm-hmm. You don't know how hard the game is if you're going into it the first time. Yeah. Um, but they had a, a difficulty called Story, which basically you know put in the shooting as kind of a, a shooting gallery without any difficulty. There was nothing to it, but it still gave you the experience of going through the story, making the decisions, and it, it played more like a straight-up role-playing game instead of an mm-hmm. action role-playing game. Uh, yeah. Deus Ex gave you that option, too, where it said, hey... You can just go through the story and have nothing to do with combat or or anything else. It removes a lot of the game, uh, yeah. but you have that option. I think that's that's great. It's wonderful. And some actually, games it absolutely wouldn't work, but some games yeah. it does. Yeah, and The Last of Us did that really well too. Uh, and like you said, it almost changes it almost changes the style of game it is in some ways. You know, The Last of Us you could play on easy and and get that incredible story. With, you know, the gameplay as kind of a an afterthought. But when I played The Last of Us the first time, I played on hard. Not not the difficulty you unlock after you beat it, but like the hardest base difficulty. And that was a survival game. Yes. I had to... I was always, always low on supplies, always low on ammo. And it added a lot of depth to the gameplay. Not just difficulty, but actual depth. You know, I had to I had to make decisions a lot more often. You know, do I engage this person or do I try to sneak around? Do I have the bullets? You know, if I get seen, am I going to be able to defend myself at all? Which you know that that's European like, extreme. Like, yeah, I like the difficulty with depth, not just the oh everything's a bullet sponge or you know, yeah you have to well, be really quick with your hands. The in, depth, in Metal Gear, go ahead. I was going to say the depth is a really really fun thing for them to add. Because mm-hmm. that's something that can make even a casual game difficult. Yeah. And games Absolutely. like uh, Zelda, the one I'm playing right now, has a slight thing with that with inventory management where you only have so many slots. And it's not that you have a shortage of weapons. It's that you're put in a tough situation where you have to decide what kind of weapons you want to keep. Mm-hmm. Which adds a whole different feel opposed to what you're used to. Just all oh, pick it up, 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 sell it all. Where now it's a, you have to think, what are you actually going to move forward with? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, I know the European extreme difficulty in the Metal Gear Solid games completely changes the way you approach that game. In my first runs through Metal Gear Solid, I would go through on normal or easy, and I just machine gun my way through fucking everything. It became a first person shooter with slight stealth elements, um, which. I enjoyed it. I had fun, but it, Metal Gear Solid is a pretty shitty first-person shooter, to be real. Yeah. <laughs> um, but going through on European Extreme, which is basically the hardest difficulty, super stealth, and if you get spotted, it's game over. So you mm-hmm. have to play perfectly from beginning to end. Of course, with saves in between. That's not crazy. Right. Um, but it makes you approach the game completely differently. All, all of a sudden, the useless items like the the empty magazines that you can throw and distract people or or the literal paper magazines that you can sit on the ground to distract people instead of becoming these useless toy items actually become some of the best weapons in your inventory for getting people out of the way it really changes the way you play the game something that's been bothering me lately is um a lot of games now aren't putting the difficulty setting even for adjustment 
It's just, this is the game, play it. And I feel that's, that's bad on two different levels. It's bad because those who want the challenge, the game has to be made in such a way where it doesn't feel challenging to them potentially. Whereas the super casuals who don't want something super deep, it might still be too much for them. Mm-hmm. I understand. Well, there, there are two different ways to, to manage that. If you don't want a typical difficulty menu in your game, something like Resident Evil 4 would dynamically adjust difficulty. If you were popping off headshots and generally being a badass, it threw more, faster, hardier enemies at you completely dynamically. The game auto-adjusted its difficulty to keep you at this perfect tension point. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you were getting your shit wrecked, it would make the enemies trip and fumble. It would remove enemies from play. It would make them slower or dodge less. Uh, it, it really hit a sweet spot. And honestly, the first couple times of the game, I didn't know it did that. I had no mm-hmm. idea. It always felt just the right amount of challenging, though. Um, I'm sure if I was looking for it, I'd, I'd see it today. Um, but then there's the... the I hate to keep using Dark Souls as an example in this, but there's the Dark Souls way of generating your own difficulty level, right? You can do what Vidapi does, and he never asks for help, and he always goes at shit so low, and that's fucking crazy with Ornstein and Smo. Holy shit. Um, <laughs> and it makes the game way harder. Or you can mm-hmm. do the me thing, where if I see a summoning sign, I summon you. It doesn't matter if I need help. It doesn't matter if I don't need help. I will fucking summon you because, holy shit, this is Dark Souls. Help me. <laughs> uh, and it makes the game easier for me. But it's a, it's a choose-your-own-difficulty level baked right into the mechanics. But then you're playing a different game. You're not playing the same yes. game. It's yes, not exactly. the same game less difficult. It's a different game. Yeah. Oh, I completely agree. They're, they're mm-hmm. two totally, totally different roads. And that's why, I mean, you can put a European Extreme Challenge on yourself while playing easy mode in Metal Gear Solid... Or you cannot. They are functionally different games. They feel completely different, but the option is always there. The difference is one is a menu driven thing where you're locked into it, and the other emerges naturally, depending on what you feel you can handle. And I see there is an added beauty to the menu one because there's games like GoldenEye back on the 64. You choose a harder difficulty. It's not that enemies are harder. Yeah, they have a little better shot. It's not that there's more of them. It's you have more shit you have to do in the levels now. You have actually Mm -hmm. more objectives because you're on a tougher difficulty. Why? Why is GoldenEye... Why why are GoldenEye and Perfect Dark the only games to fucking do this? I don't know of any other games that add objectives with higher difficulty. That was such a, a brilliant absolutely brilliant difficulty setting because not only does it fit the game it fits the theme perfectly because it's it's not easy medium hard it's agent uh what is it agent secret agent and double o agent and when Mm -hmm. you're just an average agent for mi6 of course you're gonna have less shit to do because you're just an agent but if you're a double o you have to do everything, and you've got to do it perfectly. Yep. So it fits the story, it fits the theme, it fits the gameplay, and it really, really worked for those games. Why on earth no one has tried to emulate that, I have no idea. It's one of those game it's mechanics. easier not to. Yeah. <laughs> it's easier to bump a couple numbers up in the stats. <laughs> I just, oh my god, I, I love the way GoldenEye did difficulty, because it, it felt so right, and it gave you an incentive to play through the game on harder difficulties because when you go through on agent you see a bunch of stuff in the level that you can hit and interact with but it why can i touch this button it doesn't do anything and then you Mm -hmm. get to double o you're like oh my god everything here has its purpose and i am touching all of it (laughs) it was i remember the first time i ever had that was on the bridge level i remember the first time i did double o i'm just running 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 all of a sudden like oh shit i need to go do this i never had to do this before and then I got my ass murdered because I didn't kill people over there. Yep. Yeah, I, I so, absolutely love the way they did that. So, um, what are your guys' personal preference on difficulty in games? So, and this can be genre specific, but what do you, what do you really yes. like? What, do you, what is your personal favorite? Um, it, it really depends on the genre for me. So I, I play Metal Gear Solid more like an RPG than I do a stealth game. I, I play mm-hmm. 
at least, you know, the latter Metal Gears, I played for the story more than the gameplay, which I'm probably robbing myself of an experience, but I always mm-hmm. put it on normal difficulty and just kind of tried to get through to the next hour and a half long cutscene. Um, in something like Mass Effect, I'm not playing it for the shooting difficulty. That's never why I've played Mass Effect, so I don't have an issue throwing it on easy or normal. I usually keep mm-hmm. it to normal to keep myself from getting lazy, but I don't see any reason in a, a predominantly story-driven game to play it as difficult as I could. Pride mode, hard all the way. I'll go yeah. normal the first time through, and then I see what I can do after that. Nice. Yeah, I get my I, difficulty kicks from Retro and Dark Souls. Yeah, see, that's the opposite of difficulty I, I tend to like. like I, I, I like my difficulty through, like, puzzle games or, like, survival-type stuff. You know, I played Last of Us on hard. I played Soma on hard. Um, stuff like that. The Witness was a lot of fun because it was hard. <laughs> well, that's why I like to. I I like running two times through a game. The first time I will do it to absorb the game, get the story, mm-hmm. feel what the game's about, and then the second time I'll say, "Okay, what all is here? Show me," and I will go in with the harder difficulty. Mm-hmm. Especially games like The Last of Us because that added difficulty. Oh yeah. Where next to nothing for you to find. You can't listen for zombies. It is just it turns into a horror game to a yeah. degree because you don't know what's where. Oh yeah, absolutely. And all of a sudden you have someone running up on you, grabbing you and you're dead. <laughs> or work. I completely agree with with what you said, Dad. Um yeah, I I'll run through a game uh, a lot the first time. Or, or I'm sorry, Irk. I'll, I'll run through a game the first time to just kind of absorb the the story. Uh, but the second time through, yeah, bump it up a bit. If there is a second time, some games aren't worth yeah. playing through twice. I almost never play a game through twice unless it's like a roguelike or something that you're supposed to play multiple times. And see, that's why I like about this new Nier game I'm got to pick up. The idea that you have to play multiple times to get the full ending. I love that concept. That, yeah, that's And each cool. time's a different perspective, which is really fucking cool. But mm-hmm. that's nice. I think that's pretty much all we got for um, actual new talk this week. Um, Adam, are you planning on doing any gaming next week, sir? Yes, I'm going to finish Resident Evil 7. You have my word. It will be done before the next podcast. It better be. Um, I'm holding you to that. Yeah. As every week, I'm going to be playing a lot of Rocket League, trying to get my ranks back up from the new season. And I think I'm going to jump into Isaac again. That kind of sounds fun, and I haven't played it in a while, and I haven't played it much since the update. Yeah, I haven't played Isaac since the update at all. I'm actually debating picking it up on the Switch because they yeah. have a sweet stat screen yeah. that's up the whole time. Um, it's one of those games I like to play in phases. I, I, sometimes I play it for a while and then I just don't play it for a long time. Then I play it again for a while. It's a good time killer. What are you guys going to play? I'm going to be doing Isaac or possibly Isaac. I'm going to be doing some Rocket League and I will be streaming tomorrow at around 11 or noon Eastern uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild. So if anyone wants to check it out, I'll be on live. And possibly some more Zero Dawn into the week if I beat Zelda. I will be playing um, Zelda and Binding of Isaac on my brand new Nintendo Switch, which I will acquire tomorrow. Do it. It, I will. Do it. It will happen. I swear to God. dare you. Heard you wouldn't. Yeah. What? You, you heard it. I, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do it just to prove you wrong. Here it Fuck is. You. Here it is. I'll get a switch. No balls. What? Hey, I can get a switch. Fuck there you. we go. That's, that's all you got to do. Um, I will be playing a little bit more Abduction. Hopefully, I will beat it. Um, so I, I love missed games, but they do kind of drag on. I've got to be in the mood to to just sit and experience, and not necessarily do. Um, Link to the Past, Metroid Fusion, and I am going to try the try to find those two goddamn shortcuts that I keep running past in Dark Souls 2. Holy <laughs> shit, I must be blind. As soul scream out to you next time again. Well, that's all we got for you guys this week. Um, if you like what we're doing, subscribe to us on uh, Facebook, or Facebook, holy shit, subscribe to us on YouTube and get the updates when we put up some new videos like Adam's Jubeat review that we have up on the YouTube now. Jubeat! If you want to get in on the chat conversation to be part of the show, just jump in our Twitch channel, uh, TV slash 72 Pin Connector at 10 p.m. Eastern Time every Friday. 
get in the chat, help influence what we say. Other things you can do to help influence what we say, though, is also tweet at us at 72 PC Podcast. So just get at us. Let us know what you want to hear, what you don't want to hear. If you're tired of Rocket League and Dark Souls and Zelda and want to <laughs> hear other shit, let us know. So without further ado, that's all we got for you. So until next week, game on. See you, everyone. See you, everyone. <laughs>